Hi, my name is Pamela Coons, Associate Professor of Medicine in the Division of Oncology at Yale School of Medicine and Yale Cancer Center. I'm excited to announce ASCO's new open access journal, JCO Oncology Advances. As the inaugural editor-in-chief, I hope to support JCO Oncology Advances to become the premier platform to bridge the gap between accessible scientific research and clinical care. Stay tuned for more information, including new article types, at ascopubs.org forward slash JCO Oncology Advances. We look forward to seeing your submissions in spring of 2024. The purpose of this podcast is to educate and inform. This is not a substitute for medical care and is not intended for use in the diagnosis or treatment of individual conditions. Guests on this podcast express their own opinions, experience, and conclusions. The mention of any product, service, organization, activity, or therapy should not be construed as an ASCO endorsement. Hello, and welcome to the second ASCO e-learning podcast episode focused on burnout and oncology. In the previous episode, our guest speakers discuss what burnout is, its warning signs, risk factors, preventative measures, and talked about their own personal experiences with burnout. My name is Todd Pickard, and I'm an oncology physician assistant at the MD Anderson Cancer Center. I'm pleased to introduce our three guest speakers as we continue our conversation on the prevalence of burnout and its implications for personal well-being and professional satisfaction. Dr. Faye Halakbi is a clinical health psychologist and research ethicist at the University of Chicago Medicine. She's also co-chair of the ASCO Oncology Clinician Wellbeing Task Force and has extensive research experience in burnout. We're also joined by Dr. Daniel McFarland, a medical oncologist and consult liaison psychiatrist specializing in head and neck thoracic malignancies and psycho-oncology at Northwell Health Lenox Hill Hospital. He has conducted research on empathy, resilience, and distress in trainees and edited an upcoming Springer Book publication entitled Depression, Burnout, and suicide in physicians. And finally, we are also joined by Dr. Seya Levasani, a medical oncologist specializing in breast cancer and an assistant clinical professor in the Department of Medical Oncology and Therapeutic Research at City of Hope. Dr. McFarland, you mentioned that you've been involved in research on burnout. So tell us how prevalent is burnout in oncologists and is it getting better or worse? Thanks, Todd. Yeah, a good question. Um, you know, the research that I did was more on uh, empathy, resilience, and distress, not burnout. I didn't actually measure burnout. But the latter part of your question, I'll tell you that um, some data indicate that it is increasing. Um, in general, oncologists are in the middle of the pack in terms of medical specialties and where they fall in terms of uh, how burnt out they are. And really speaks to the drivers of burnout being not always what you think that they might be. Um, uh, you know, as a specialty, we see a lot of uh, patients at the end of life. Um, but as kind of has been mentioned, um, these are really more systemic administrative issues, although it can be communication. And, and again, it's just everyone is a little different um, in that regard. So uh, we are, you know, whether it's actually increasing or we're just having more attention to it is, is probably. Um, a, a good question, but either way, um, it's there, it has been there, it's a problem, and you know, we should do something about it. So Dr. McFarland, I really like the fact that you just said we should do something about it, and that leads to my next question. Is there any evidence-based interventions that we can use to prevent burnout? Absolutely. Um, there are uh, several good meta-analyses, in fact, um, so people have been looking at this across the board. The caveat is that they're not always specific for the setting, and I don't think there is a way to make that necessarily possible given the multitude of settings. Um, but in general, um, they're across the board doing something seems to be better than nothing. The issue is, well, how are they durable responses, um, and what exactly are you measuring? So, what if you have a drop in burnout by two points? Um, is that enough? It looks like actually even a few points, and I think it's around four points of on the Maslow uh, scale, MBI, Maslow Burnout Index, 
if they could correct me on that, I guess. Um, but if there's just even a small drop, then it is uh, that has been shown to be a meaningful change, uh, which is wonderful. Now, in kind of like sub analyses in these meta analyses, they've shown that the kinds of interventions that are most effective are organizational interventions. And most of those types of interventions are things like work hour restrictions and um, workflow modification. But the ca big caveat there is a lot of those were done in trainees uh, where they would have work hour restrictions. So again, it's it's you have to sort of take the data for what they are and if it's applicable, then great. If it's not, you know, you maybe try something else. So the take home message is that the organizational type interventions are not only more efficacious, but seem to be uh, longer lasting in their efficacy. But that doesn't mean that that individual interventions don't work because they do, uh, they also work. And I would say from the sub analyses that I've seen, if the interventions incorporate mindfulness or some part of CBT, uh, that's cognitive behavioral therapy, those interventions seem to work the best. The combination would be ideal of uh, organizational changes with uh, individual types of, um, of changes. And a lot of this comes down to sort of uh, system-based changes, um, adapt, you know, I think of like adaptive trial designs, like that's essentially kind of what's needed. Um, one thing's gonna work in this setting, another thing will work in another setting. You know, each field has its own sort of drivers of burnout. Uh, I'll tell you, for example, totally outside of, of oncology, that with psychiatrists who, again, don't have the highest rates of burnout for probably the reasons that we talked about, but actually violence. A lot of psychiatrists have had have been hit by a patient or had, you know, violence thrust upon them. Um, and it's a real cause of, of burnout. I, I just would have never exactly put that together. So I, the the point is, is that for each discipline, there are specific uh, things, and then there are general kinds of drivers of burnout. I think we all, you know, work with the electronic medical record. We we all have bosses and administration that we work for, and so it's it's a matter of kind of putting these things together. Yeah, I. I... You know, it really it resonates with me that there's a lot of things that we hear about, but then there's there's a difference between understanding what what's out in the literature, what what you hear articulated, but then how do you turn that into practical methods? You know, Dr. Hibaki, how can how can our listeners adapt some practical methods for preventing burnout that that's easy to implement? Thank you. Um, awareness and education is key. It's truly being aware, truly being motivated. Um, we talked about self-assessment. That was actually one of the first strategies that we described in our um, educational book in, in 2016 with Dr. Back and, and Chanifelt of, of really doing that, as, as Dr. McFarland talked about, really doing that, that self-assessment. One to 10, how irritable, how sad, what am I, um, you know, reading that and not just reading yourself multiple times a day, having a barometer. And again, asking that trusted observer, maybe it's your wife, maybe it's your colleague. And then of course, to seek uh, support if that is needed, if it does become too extreme, but clearly we know awareness and education is key. Education. So some of the early um, internal medicine work showed that a simple one hour educational talk on burnout, on well being not just informed the attendees, but also compelled them to um, practice preventative behaviors. What was that? Exercise, getting better sleep, trying to leave work on time if they were able to, better nutrition. It is these simple things. I work with oncology fellows and, and teach them communication. And we, we have a, a formal burnout and um, compassion fatigue course. And that is what we did in one a study was just do an education little didactic, six months later, evaluated them um, using the ProCall and, and the MBI. And very similarly, they changed their behaviors. They changed their practices. Even the qualitative responses told us. So, so education is so key. And I motivate leaders so much to simply have a one hour you know, human grand rounds on burnout, get some CME. So it, it motivates the docs to come in and to attend and to learn because it is only through education do we know what to look for and what to address. Self-care is critical. I cannot emphasize that enough. Yes, 
burnout is an occupational phenomenon without a doubt. But in order to find meaning and joy and purpose in your work again, to find, to, to research, to rekindle um, that joy that you, you have, you have to practice some techniques. So again, it's these preventative behaviors. Um, uh, again, just basic needs of sleep and nutrition and exercise. But it's also things like writing a narrative. Um, when you had a patient case that maybe went a little bit south, write a little narrative about what happened so you can be self-reflective of that. Journaling, having, you know, talking the, about that patient story, that patient story that went well, that patient story that went really bad. Uh, gratitude, gratitude is kind of a newer phenomenon coming out. But uh, we teach docs to um, just name three things that you're grateful for in the morning, in the afternoon, and before you go to bed. It's a way of seeking self-compassion and kindness where you haven't been. Um, mindfulness. Uh, Dr. McFarland talked about mindfulness. I will. Uh, my conflict of interest is that I am a mindful teacher. I, I teach this with uh, with patients and with my uh, 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 colleagues and um, students. It is intentional, purposeful. It's not about sitting in the corner and doing some yoga and breathing, but truly teaching the docs, teaching my colleagues to do some breath work before they start their EMR, right? Mindful hand-washing techniques of really taking the time when we're washing our hands, a real contemplative practice um, to be able to recharge and refresh during that course of the day. Although self-care is critical, and I, I view it very much as it being your life preserver, um, sometimes when colleagues say, you know, it's my organization that's really beat me down, it's, it's not my fault I'm burned out, my analogy is, gosh, if you're on a sinking ship, won't you use your life preserver? That's what self-care is. But equally important is for the organization to please provide that support, um, to empower the oncology clinician, to use the team. So many times I encourage the colleagues to use your team members. You're, we're all in it together, but you know to truly work together as a community because it's only as a community we'll be able to, to address this issue um, and that. So, so truly self-care is vital without a doubt. Can't say more, more than enough about it. So many things that you just said resonate so strongly with me. You know, that sense of community where you feel like the stress and everything that you're going through is shared. And that sense of gratitude, you know, just thinking about a few things that are going right, it just lowers the threshold. It lowers the stress. So that, that's, let's, let's stick with stress for a second. Um, Dr. Levasani, in your experience, what are the effective strategies that you've used uh, or experienced to mitigate stress levels that are helpful? Yeah, you know, when I experienced burnout, then I decided to learn how to cope with, uh, with it and to reduce my stress level. I realized that, uh, you know, that situation was not sustainable and they needed to uh, take some action. So what I do is that I usually set aside one hour every night for myself to do things that I enjoy. It's like my me time. <laughs> So this could be cooking or reading a book one night or watching my favorite show on TV or Netflix the other night. And um, also one day that I relax is uh, by listening to music. Uh, when I'm uh, tired of doing my administrative work day, uh, days that I'm in office, I just, you know, listen to my favorite song. It's just three to four minutes, but it makes me feel better. And then I go back to my work. It's also, I think it's very important to set aside uh, some time to do exercise uh, if it's not possible every day, but a few times per week. And our nutrition is also very important, as you know, um, Faye was uh, mentioning as well. Initially, when I started to work as an attending, I was um, always skipping lunch in clinic. But then I learned that uh, actually, Taking that half an hour break to have lunch uh, helps me to feel better and uh, to recharge, and then I can go back to my clinical duties. And also, uh, I try to stay organized and complete my tasks on time. It uh, helps me to avoid procrastination that uh, really increases my anxiety level. Yeah, because then I feel like I have unfinished, you know, things to do and just, you know, that it increases my stress. So I, I try to really be organized and um, stay, uh, be on time for everything. 
And um, this is something that is very difficult. I'm learning uh, to do that. And that's basically to say no to unrealistic demands. Uh, medical oncologists, like uh, other physicians, we have learned to say yes to all expectations. This is something that we need to work um, towards on learning. The expectations and demands on us is really uh, high. And uh, we feel like we always must serve others and their needs, including our institution's administration. We have turned into passive individuals that, you know, we agree to whatever that is thrown on us. Unfortunately, in a lot of practices, there is a disconnect between administration and physicians. And so it's very important to uh, engage the administration, to recognize burnout. And it can really affect productivity. And uh, they need to come up with an action plan to help uh, physicians to do things that will make our lives uh, easier. And um, definitely um, getting support from other team members, from our colleagues is very important. Uh, our peers, they uh, play a very important role in helping us, you know, and supporting us. And we always, we, we are stronger if we stick together. So it definitely, this is also very important to have that support system at work. You know, it's really important that when there is that disconnect between you know, your your practice, your institution, the administrators, and what the individual providers need, they've got to have a resource. You know, and that brings me to my next question. You know, this is where ASCO has actually something that might help. So, Dr. Labaki, um, you're serving as co-chair for the ASCO Oncology Clinical Wellbeing Task Force. Can you walk us through the work that this task force is doing? What kinds of tools and resources are, are being developed and offered? Oh, thank you. It's it's such a privilege to introduce our membership to this wonderful task force that's in our infancy, and it's an honor to serve as co-chair with Hugh Shervastani. It was a collaborative effort between both the Ethics Committee and the Clinical Practice Committee um, to gather a group of folks that are experts, um, including, for example, Dr. McFarlane is one of our, our task force members um, that where we could actually focus on the oncology a clinician well-being and how have we defined well-being is it's been adapted from the National Academy of Medicine's um, definition that it's this integrative uh, concept that characterizes the quality of life that encompasses that individual's work-related activities, the personal, the health, the environmental, and, and the psychosocial factors as well. And our mission is to improve that quality, the safety, and the value of cancer care by um, enhancing enhancing oncologist well-being, and the sustainability of the practice as well. Um, we have a five-year plan. Our task force um, has a five-year charter and roadmap. What the aim is really to, to promote well-being across the ASCO activities, diversifying um, resources to promote um, and identify the needs through research activities to identify the needs of that individual clinician to improve um, the practice as well. So ultimately, our vision is um, across ASCO to create programs and strategies that can really help the clinician as well as I think the cancer organization as well. As I said, many leaders come to us wanting to implement um, interventions and not really knowing how to. Um, so although we are in our infancy, we um, have been quite busy um, and we've developed uh, a research page that all members can um, access that has um, empirical research on there and um, also some tools that could be used, multiple resources on there. Um, we also had a webinar um, to introduce the task force to the members, of course, the purposes and, and the charter. Um, we also recently published an editorial in the JCOJOP of talking about the impact of COVID on burnout, moral distress, and the emotional well-being of the oncologist. And it, that actually has multiple useful interventions that the organization might consider as well. And we just conducted a focus group study that is currently under peer review of the oncologist experience, both the personal and occupational experiences during the COVID uh, pandemic. What is that oncologist going through? So very busy. Um, again, in our infancy, we have lots of plans to uh, hope and look forward to, um, to all of these endeavors. And of course, your feedback on it. We are here to help and serve you. And we are very grateful to ask the leadership for giving us this opportunity to advocate for the oncology team. 
Um, could I just say one other thought that I had? When we were talking about the interventions, I was just going to say that one way that I think about the interventions that might be helpful is that there are some interventions that are sort of pulling the clinician a away from the work environment, um, whereas others are having the clinician kind of engage more strongly with the work environment or in a different way. And the latter seem to obviously be a little bit more uh, effective or, you know, um, kind of makes sense uh, because we've all had that feeling of being on vacation and then you go back and it's the same thing. Um, and so I just wanted to add that that's just another way of kind of looking at the, at the interventions. I always talk about this study that was done in Oregon like 20 years ago because yeah. it was so genius that what they did was they basically, it's a group of like five different community oncology practices. They got together and they said, okay, listen, burnout's a problem. We're measuring it. You guys figure it out and we're going to remeasure it. And yeah. the beauty of it was that it addressed what some of the problems of burnout are, that feeling like you're in control. And then kind of having that engagement part where you're um, you're engaging with whatever you're creating to, to mitigate the burnout. And thirdly, it brought the oncologists together. So they had to figure it out in their own way and what made sense for them. Um, and in my mind, that's like the perfect solution. And it does help bring administration and clinicians together because ultimately we do all care about the same thing. It's a great example of peer support, Daniel. You know, we always talk about peer support. And I think a lot of folks say, what does that look like? Is that like a group thing? And exactly that study of getting everyone together to talk about it, it of how can we make change? How can we improve burnout at our organization is critical. That's why it really, it can't just be leadership alone. We need physician champions. We need lots of folks involved in the process to ultimately improve the quality of cancer care at that institution. And I think honestly, nationally and globally, you know, that, that's kind of what I think even our task force is, is about. Oncology is a team sport. Yeah. You know, we're all in it together. And, and we're all, if we're all, exactly. If we're taking the patient care in all of our hands, well then we all have a responsibility for preventing burnout and backing each other up and and talking about this and being that trusted person to be that barometer. So, you know, yeah. it's a team sport. Yeah. We, no person stands alone. Yeah. And the oncology clinician, you know, is the most compassionate clinician, I think, out there. Truly. Of course, I a little bit of bias there, but truly, my colleagues are the most compassionate, kindest people, people I just love being around. But it's so tough to show self-compassion, isn't it? We're great at giving compassion to others, to the suffering, but to solve that that tends to be a little bit more difficult. So that's why we have to help all one another, as you said. Well, this has been a terrific conversation. So thank you, Dr. Lavasani. Thank you, Dr. Hlavaki. Thank you, Dr. McFarland, for your engagement and conversation today. That is all the time we have. Um, but we thank all of our listeners today for listening to this episode of the ASCO eLearning Podcast. To keep up to date with the latest episodes, please click to subscribe. And let us know what you think about the podcast. Leave us a review or email us at elearning at asco.org. Thanks so much, everybody. Thank you for listening to this week's episode of the ASCO eLearning Weekly Podcast. To make us part of your weekly routine, click subscribe. Let us know what you think by leaving a review. For more information, visit the Comprehensive eLearning Center at elearning.asco.org.